Alouette's head coach, Dan Hawkins, are joining us. Um, Dan, officially, welcome to Montreal. I appreciate it, Dave. Thank you. And I guess we could say officially because I understand you have found uh, a home in Montreal, and that's got to be a big part of the process. Yeah, I haven't signed the papers yet, but uh, hopefully I'll get that done tonight. Tell us what that's like, though. I mean, we know the players, of course, um, changing teams, changing cities uh, on occasion. And for the coaching staff, it can be the same way. And there are families involved, and that has to be, um, I guess, part of the process. Yeah, most of us are not packing little ones. Most of us that are here that have kids, they're older, so they're not technically living with us. But it's uh, it's part of the excitement uh, of well, of, of learning a different community, a diff different part of the country, different uh, situations culturally and, and whatnot. So... Uh, but God bless the coaches' wives because they're used to that. They, they, they've done that for a while. Tell us how these couple of weeks have sunk in, Dan. Well, it's just been a grind-a-thon. Uh, I said, by and large, we're pretty familiar with the Metro and pretty familiar with our offices now, other than going to the Canadians game against the Rangers. There hasn't been a lot of extracurricular other than take the Metro somewhere to fill out some papers. Uh, but it's really gone well. I really, really like our staff. A real bunch of really good people with a lot of experience. And um, so it's fun to get in a room, compare notes. We did this. We did this. We tried this. Kind of come up with the best of, of both worlds. And uh, we've made some good progress. Got a lot of ways to go, but we've made good progress. And to know that the training camp is uh, three months away, do you feel the clock ticking? Oh, yeah. And, and really uh, – Ever since taking this, and I told our guys, we, we have to be ready to go from zero to 60 in no time flat. And we've got to be able to hit the ground running and basically imagine, can we win tomorrow? And that's really uh, maybe win today is even the, in the better uh, sense of the word. There's no time to develop, no time to work. Uh, we've got to be able to get things efficiently enough so we can take off and, and be, uh, be rolling in a hurry. Dan, a couple of things that struck me when you were introduced as head coach of the Alouette. So you mentioned, um, number one, you're an out-of-the-box kind of guy. Tell us what you mean by that. I just, Abe, I've just never – I was just talking to AC in the locker room, and he's going to Mexico, and I said, okay, now, one, have you went to uh, Chichen Itza? He goes, yes. I said, did you jump into the cenotes? He said, yes. I said, okay, number three, did you swim with the whale sharks? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not, I said, no, there's no risk really at all. There's no, nothing to fear. Um, I just think that's where the growth comes. That's the development. I think it's easy to, to kind of stay in your comfort zone. And I'm not faulting anybody because, you know, uh, that's their, their station in life, and that's great. But to me, the growth comes in trying, failing, learning, adapting. Um, so to me, coming here, learning French, learning the Canadian game, living in the Eastern time zone. I mean, everything. It's just continual growth. You're, you're, you're just your whole experience is expanding. Another thing you said uh, when you're introduced as head coach of the Alouettes that um, I guess most recently you, you got your Ph.D. in football. Yeah. Help us understand that. Yeah. Well, you coach, 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 and you're, you're in your sphere of existence. But then when you're able to back up and start really researching – and gathering data and gathering information from a number of resources, uh, really eye-popping and really just tremendous growth. Uh, went to a bunch of NFL camps. I came up here, uh, college, just looking at a lot of film, talking to a lot of coaches, watching a lot of people practice. And really, you go out with a thesis statement just like you do getting your Ph.D. and you're either confirming or denying that thesis. So it was it was tremendous. You've known Jim Pop for a long time. But tell us about your relationship with the uh, LGM. Uh, really interesting because one of the guys that I coached worked with him in NFL Europe, and he knew that I went around all these NFL camps. Well, Jim was at Saskatchewan at the time, didn't have the resources to have all the scouting, and said, we got hooked up. Now, the interesting thing, I had no clue what Jim looked like, really. That was pre-internet days. Uh, so did some scouting for him during that time. I think at one time I did look up on the Internet and go, oh, that, that's what he looks like. The interesting thing, not until Colorado, he came up at the offices and said, uh, Dan. And I go, yeah. And he goes, Jim Pop. I'm like, oh, I never met the guy. So I knew him for you know, a long time over the phone and sending, but never met him really in person. And then nothing really happened until uh, last year when my son Cody was trying to explore some CFI. I said, look, Cody, I don't. I said, call Jim, though. Jim knows he'll, he'll help you out. And that's just kind of how it, how it evolved. And it was, you know, as Mark Tressman would say, the alignment of the stars and just 
It just happened. I would imagine uh, that uh, in football, as in life and in other professional areas, so much of what we do is uh, based on relationships. And I'd have to think that would be the same for you, your coaching staff. You've got a large staff, and you've got to manage that staff. Yeah, and the great thing is there's just only a couple of those guys that I knew previously, but you always know somebody that knows somebody. And to me, trying to figure out, you can have a resume that's, 12 pages thick and looks great. But like, I remember the first time I talked to Doug Barry, I said, well, what kind of culture are you looking for on the staff? And he goes, well, gosh, I've never been asked that before. And I'm thinking that's the, one of the most important things, right? I mean, do you laugh? Do you smile? What kind of music do you listen to? You know, what turns you on? What turns you off? I mean, all those things, but I'm really into this. I call it low ego and high output. I think you have to, to realize that you're uh, part of a big, and I always say, I want a person that, that's humble enough to, to uh, you know, scrub the toilets if they need to be scrubbed, but have enough moxie to run the organization if that would be the case. Ronnie and, and RJ, they've been around here through a lot of coaches. They've seen a lot of football. They've seen a lot of things. I said, guys, please don't sit over there and not say anything because you think, well, I'm not the coach. Well, my goodness, if the captain is going to drive the Titanic into the iceberg, could you please go, hey – might want to turn this thing just a little bit. Uh, so I do think we have a lot of really good people that care about the players, care about the craft. You know, as Mark and I would say, the science of football, understanding that, but also understanding the other intangible part of it, of reaching out into someone's heart and soul and understanding the role of the coach and, and uh, all that stuff's important to me. Okay, so I have to ask you, having mentioned it, what kind of music do you listen to? Boy, you know what, Abe? If I drop my iPod, you would you'd have a hard time figuring out really what demographic, you know, because there's some foreign language stuff on there. There there's rock, there's opera, there's rap, there's country, there's uh, I don't I I tend to probably push myself away. Again, this doesn't surprise you. I'm not always like a top forty guy. But uh, it was interesting. I was doing a radio thing yesterday. I'm a big, great Big C fan who's from Newfoundland. But, you know, they're awesome. But a lot of people, they've never heard of them. Uh, but they're great. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the old favorites. But shoot. Can't out. pigeonhole you. No, you could probably see me in a lot of different venues. Um, you spent some time with uh, the Alouettes in Raleigh last year. And um, I think you spent some time in Montreal after as well. When you look at those two events, did you ever think in the back of your mind, you know what, there, there might be something here for me one day. Uh, I really didn't, Abe, and I think it's funny because you've got the, uh, the conspiracy, conspiracy theorists out there. I'm one of those guys, I think if you just keep throwing seed on the ground, I mean, it's just you're opening yourself up to anything, and it's not that I want something or I expect something. To me, it's an experience in and of itself. Uh, Mark Tressman and his staff were just kind enough to invite me into their – and it was great. It was an enriching experience for a lot of reasons. Even if I would have never coached again, I learned a lot from those people coming here. And that's why I said I love the city. We, my wife and I love the vibrancy, the kind of the Europe feel to it. And uh, it was great. Um, but didn't really do it for that reason. It was just, hey, if nothing would have happened, I would have met Mark Tressman, who's great. I would have learned a lot of football, and I would have experienced Montreal. But that really wasn't in the back of my mind. So what's it like? Uh, for us to sit here and for you to wear the Alouette logo on your chest? Well, one of the things I've learned over all these many years is it's that's that's what it's about. And, hey, Dan Hawkins, it's not about Dan Hawkins. I hope to fulfill my role, but we have an outstanding owner who cares a lot about the business of the Montreal Alouettes and, and having a stable franchise here and a stable entity the role of the Alouettes in the community, uh, what it means to the players, and the winning part of it. He gets all of that. Jim Pop, extremely successful, number of Grey Cups, has coached, been the GM. Um, and then, you know, you, you are in Montreal. So being part of a great tradition and a great organization, because to me that's, that's, what it, that's what it is. We're, this is who we're all representing here, and it, and it is a tremendous honor. It's um, – you know, I mean, shoot, when, when I was in on this deal a little bit, a lot of guys were going, oh, that's the best organization in the CFL bar. And I'm, you know, Jim Pop's the best GM, which I you certainly have a feeling, but I think I was getting this from everybody, going that's the best team, that's the best GM, that's the best owner. I mean, so 
you feel very honored and very humbled to uh, to represent the the shield. Hello, I said Coach Dan Hawkins joining us today. Uh, Dan, thank you for this. You're welcome, Abe. Thank you.